Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's program, Girl Decoded, with Affectiva co-founder and CEO Rana Kalaube and NPR commentator Arthi Shahani. I'm Dan Lewin, CEO of the Computer History Museum. On behalf of the CHM volunteers, members, trustees, and staff, we hope everyone is well and safe. At CHM, we've made it our mission to decode technology for everyone its computing past, digital present, and its future impact on humanity. Especially today when we're all coping with the pandemic and when both adults and children are spending more and more time interacting with technology, this mission is more important than ever. In today's program, we'll learn if it's possible to humanize technology so that it can serve us all better. Our programs are made possible through the generosity of our members and donors, and we need everyone to consider opting in and supporting CHM and these kinds of conversations. They're timely and it's just the beginning. If you're not already a member, please consider joining, going to our website, taking a look at the opportunity. Introducing today's speakers is the founding director of the Exponential Center at CHM, Marguerite Gong Hancock. Please join me in having Marguerite kick off today's program. Uh, thank you so much, Daniel. Daniel, uh, facial expressions, tone of voice, body language, the majority of human communication is conveyed through nonverbal uh, non cues, but while sheltering in place and social distancing during the COVID pandemic, we're spending more and more time interacting with each other through our smartphones and technology devices that don't convey our full human emotional intelligence. Can we teach machines to read our emotions and adapt in real time? Can we encode our technologies with human qualities like kindness and empathy? Dr. Rana el Kalyubi uh, explores these issues and more in her new book, Girl Decoded. Today, we're just so thrilled to welcome Rana and NPR's Arthi Shahani to explore how has Rana's personal and professional journey unfolded in a way to uniquely shape her work and impact? What is emotion, uh, artificial intelligence, and how can it be applied to our lives, such as for improving mental health and automotive technology? And how can we build empathy, empathy into communications in our virtual world? And, and where can emotion AI technology go wrong and how can we prevent that? We're in great hands today. Dr. Ron El Kalubi is an acclaimed TED and Aspen Ideas speaker, named one of America's top 50 women in technology by Forbes and included in Fortune's 40 under 40 list. Her experience as an immigrant, a Muslim, a woman computer scientist has deeply informed her work as a pioneer in artificial emotional intelligence and co-founder and CEO of AI startup Effectiva. Moderator Arthi Shahani is also an immigrant and an advocate for immigrants' rights in addition to her work as a veteran technology correspondent for NPR. As is our tradition here at CHM, I'll introduce our pair of speakers today with five numbers. First, Rana El Klubi, 53 million, the amount of VC funding raised for Affectiva. 90, countries where Affectiva's Emotion AI is used. 9.8 million faces analyzed by Affectiva's Emotion AI, all with opt-in and consent, and 10 tech, nonprofit, networking, and academic organization that Rana is part of and supports. 2016, a big year, the year that Rana became a US citizen, CEO of the company she co-founded, and bought her first home. Welcome, Rana. And now five numbers to introduce Arthi Shahani. One book, three careers, 9-11, the date that changed her trajectory. 4-11, new approach to life as a journalist. And four, religious houses of worship that she attended as a child. Welcome, Arthi. It's a pleasure to feature you both on today's CHM Live event. We look forward to your conversation on this important, timely topic. Over to you, Arthi. Thank you so much. And it is wonderful to be here uh, with Rana and members of the Computer History Museum and folks joining us online. Um, I uh, am going to just start by introducing the book a bit and guiding some discussion with Dr. Rana El Kalyubi and then turning it over to questions in about an hour or so. Dr. Rana El Kalyubi was born in Egypt, lived in Kuwait until the first Gulf War in 1990, and then moved with her family to the United Arab Emirates, where, by the way, I have family as well. 
She studied computer science in Egypt and then did her doctorate at the University of Cambridge. In 2009, she went over to the other Cambridge, crossing the Atlantic and becoming a research scientist at the MIT Media Lab. Her project there spun off into a company that she's known for around the world today, Effectiva. In her new book, Girl Decoded, which she co-authored with writer Carol Coleman, Rana maps two different journeys. One is that of a first-generation American technologist and CEO, CEO who embodies success. The other is that of an Egyptian woman, or you could say Egyptian-American woman, whose marriage falls apart uh, and has failed at what she thought had mattered most, family. Really stark contrast in this book that she's brought out. Rana, I want to first ask you a question that um, I just need to know. We are seeing each other on a screen. Mm -hmm. I want to know if you are tracking my emotions (laughs) with anything besides your own intelligence. (laughs) Um, Do you have something going to read my face? (laughs) I am not because uh, I don't have your consent to do that. Uh, if, okay. if I, yeah, uh, we, 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 we wouldn't do that except if we had uh, opt-in and consent, but it would be but really- But you didn't even ask me. So. I know. <laughs> well, what I really want to be tracking actually is the audience's response to our conversation. Because if oh. we were doing this live together yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. at the that museum, we would, we would riff off of the audience's energy. And, and I so miss that. I don't know about yeah. that. Yeah. Absolutely. That's so true. It's a great point. Because if we had that there, we'd sort of have something to, to guide us in a way that we just don't right now. Exactly. Well, I had to ask you, I was very curious, very <laughs> tickled by some of what you're able to do. Rana, start a little bit. I mean, you have, I would say, a wild professional as well as personal journey. Um, and let's talk about them in that order, starting with your work. Um, You're best known for emotional AI, for building algorithms that read the face to detect emotional states. How did that become your life's focus? Um, It all started actually um, back in Cairo. I had just graduated a computer science as an undergraduate and I was looking for a a research topic. And um, my fiance at the time, kind of pointed me to this book called Affective Computing by an MIT scientist called Rosalind Picard. And it took forever to ship the book to Egypt, but eventually I read it. And the thesis in the book was that emotions are really kind of front and center of our lives and they guide our decision-making. And it's important for technology to have some kind of emotional intelligence, not just cognitive intelligence. And so that set me on a journey to, to build machines that have both IQ and EQ um, yeah. Mm-hmm. And flesh out a little bit. And by the way, why did the book take so long? Do you know? I, I uh, wondered about that. To, to write? To reach you. No, no, to reach you. No, no, I'm sorry. I don't know. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> took a lot to write too. Um, well, um, so I ordered it on Amazon. This was in 1998 and it took about three months to ship to Cairo, probably because Amazon didn't really ship to Cairo back then, but then it got held in customs. And for some reason, they just couldn't, you know, they wouldn't let it, they wouldn't let it out there. And and I I don't really know why, Um, but eventually. Did they sense there were dangerous ideas? I guess. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. And I thought that that was an interesting detail. So describe a little bit why it interested you. What got you excited as the young Rana about, oh, what can I do here? Yeah, I, I am very, um, I, I think I have high EQ, like even back in school, I was always the kid who was attuned to other nonverbal signals. So the way we communicate is only 10% of how we communicate our emotions and our mental states is in the choice of words we use. Almost 90% is nonverbal. It's facial expressions, hand gestures, vocal intonations. And as a kid, I was super attuned to that. Um, I wasn't allowed to date in high school or through college, but I could watch, you know, other, you know, my friends around me uh, date and I could tap into the relationships just by kind of cluing into the nonverbal signal. So I was always fascinated by that. And then, of course, I get to Cambridge University and it was my well, first- You actually described predicting a breakup according to body language you saw among a couple of friends. Is that right? Ex- yeah, exactly. That was in high school and I could see- 
you know, the, so, so there was th this couple and they were dating in high school. But then there was like all of these other exchanges between, um, you know, the, the young woman and another guy. And I was like, hmm, that like they're definitely crushing on each other here. And sure enough, and if, you know, a few days later, the couple broke up and the other two um, got together. So I was mm -hmm. right. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so you thought, what if I could teach a computer to do what I do? Kind of, you know, I had an aha moment. So when I got to Cambridge University, um, I had this realization that I was spending way more time with my device than I did with any other human being, which sounds really sad. But if you think about it, we're all spending hours and hours on our devices. Um, but I also had this realization that m my device was my main portal of communication with my family back home. I was doing a lot of you know, chatting at the time. Um, I use a platform called ICQ for all of you out there who remember that. And I just felt that the richness of our emotional communication kind of disappeared in cyberspace. Um, there were days, there was actually one so um, homesick. And, um, but, but, I, but I didn't want to text that. I just wished that my family could sense that. Um, and, and they didn't. So, and it just set me on this journey to ask, you know, what if our machines had emotional intelligence, what kind of applications would that unlock? And mm -hmm. yeah, that was 20 years ago. So. And so that was a huge driving force for you was just this wanting to be understood long distance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just realizing, I mean, just realizing that technology is so powerful. It allows us to, um, get in touch with um, many people all over the world. My family is very geographically dispersed. So I, I'm, I'm, great for, I'm grateful that we can connect, but the quality of the connection, I feel like technology creates an illusion of a connection, but it's not really a deep connection. And, and that's what I'm trying to fix. And can you explain that a little bit more? What do you mean by that? Yeah. The illusion like, of a connection. Yeah. I mean, you, I mean, think about, I mean, I have thousands of friends on Facebook, but um, so, so in terms of quantity, I feel like technology has helped us connect with many, many people, like the numbers are there, but the depth of each connection isn't there. I feel like there's a lot of misunderstanding when we communicate over text, regardless of whether it's a personal communication or a business and professional communication. Um, like there's it, no tone. I could say that's great or that's great. Right. And you could still put the emoji at the end, but it's very explicit. It's not like me walking into the room and saying, Ooh, you look like really like I'll call my mom. My mom lives in Cairo and I'll just say hello. And she'll say, what's wrong with you? Like, tell me what's wrong. What happened? Like just from my vocal intonation. And mm -hmm. I feel like technology takes away some of that. Um, and there's an opportunity. I mean, again, the perfect example is right now we have hundreds of people tuned into this conversation. And if we were live, you and I would very easily riff off of that energy and we would be able to tap into are people engaged? Are they leaning into the conversation? Are they rolling their eyes? And we would like adapt right away, but we can't do that right now. I feel like it's, it's like talking to a wall sometimes. And so then for you as a technologist, cause you know, you and I, we might experience day-to-day -day challenges differently. Do you see, for example, in this pandemic, kind of an opportunity of, oh, if people were to opt in on the Zoom call to have their facial expressions read, that this could somehow become feedback for the people who are presenting or whatnot to, to create some proxy or sort of ambient environment similar to what we'd have in the real world? Exactly. And it doesn't mean that you as an audience, I, I feel like there's value for the presenter, but there's also value for the audience. We're all craving to be part of to, to have a sense of shared experience. Um, and so imagine if we had like a very simplified, cool visualization at the bottom of Zoom, where, you know, if people are engaged, we would see a green bar light up. And if people were really like disengaged or, you know, tuning out, we would see more red, I don't know. And um, that would be available both to the presenters, um, like you and I, but also the mm -hmm. audience so that they feel that they're contributing um, you know, to the, to the conversation. Sure. Sure. Can you tell me that a little bit, Rana? So I get that you had just like a real life problem and experience, which is that you're constantly long distance from your loved ones and they've been long distance from each other for a long time. How does that, that become 
translated into your life's work as a technologist? Yeah, it really all started with this question, right? Like, what if computers could understand and I focused on the face, right? Like there's other modalities like physiology or hand gestures or voice, but I was so fascinated with, face, with the face as kind of a, a really fascinating canvas for communicating expressions. Um, and so I started asking like, what, you know, what, what if computers could understand our facial expressions and what kind of use cases would that unlock? And so, you know, and my background is, a, is I'm a computer scientist. I am not a psychologist and I really didn't know emotion science uh, or facial expression um, science. And so I had to dive into that. Um, So I would really characterize my work as the intersection of the science of emotions and and facial emotions with technology and computer science and machine learning too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You describe in your book, um, you know, you, you're going to various, um, educational campuses in Egypt and Cambridge and coming over to Massachusetts, you describe basically meeting somebody who becomes your mentor, your confidant, your mind meld. A woman named Rosalind Picard, she's author of the book Affective Computing. That's the book that took forever to be shipped to you in Egypt. It was held at the customs. Right. Talk about meeting Rosalind and what it meant for you in your career to find somebody with whom you had so much synergy. Yeah, and she continues to be my role model um, and somebody who I really look up to. Um, Yeah, so started with reading her book, which I would argue changed the trajectory of my life um, because reading the book had a lot of implications beyond just my research, right? As you know, having read the book. Um, Effective computing. Yeah, exactly. Effective computing. And, And there she posits that, you know, technology needs to have emotional intelligence, not just cognitive intelligence. Um, So I read the book in 1998 and that kind of changed my focus and my my research focus. And I only got to meet Roz in person in 2004 and it was very serendipitous. So I was, you know, doing my PhD at Cambridge University. I had never, um, I had never, I actually had visited the United States, but I had never spent any time in the U.S., But as it turns out, Roz was coming to Cambridge, UK to give a a keynote at a a machine learning conference. And she emailed Cambridge University and she said, I'll be visiting. Are there any students who I should really meet? And I saw the email and I I was I signed up. Right. And and she had like 15 minute slots for each student. Mm -hmm. And I spent a lot of time thinking about how I wanted to spend the 15 Ah, minutes. I wanted to show her a demo (laughs) and. I thought about what I was going to wear. I was Every like, well, I want to be kind of formal, but I also want, yeah, yeah. you know, I want it to be memorable. So I wore orange with turn, you know, so anyway, I spent a lot of time <laughs> thinking about it. and we end up meeting and we totally hit it off. Like we were talking mm-hmm. super fast, like, you know, riffing mm-hmm. off of each other's ideas. Um, and we, end, you know, she ended up inviting me to her lab at MIT and, and then we co-founded Affectiva together. And, and for me, what was really magical about meeting Roz is she's not only an amazing scientist and inventor, but also she's a mother of three. She's a wife. And um, I, I just was, I could really see myself in her. Um, and I think that's the true power of, of a mentor where you can really resonate with that person. So. What did she do as a mentor that was particular? Like, what, what has she taught you about the act of mentorship? Um, if, uh, you know, a lot of lessons, but one in particular comes to mind. So when we first met at Cambridge, she said, well, come over to MIT, but we have to figure out the funding. And so we applied to the National Science Foundation for a grant um, to basically encapsulate my technology, this facial analysis engine into a Google-like device. This was in 2006, way before Google Glass. Um, So we wrote up the proposal. She from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I was in Cairo, Egypt. I was back in Cairo now. And so we would work around the clock, basically editing the proposal. We send it to the NSF and they, the review was basically amazing idea you guys have the intellectual merit to do it, but it's impossible. It's so ambitious. So they declined the proposal. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was the end of it. I was like, okay, Mm -hmm. my dream to like work with Roz and go to MIT is over. And I remember her calling me from 
uh, from MIT. And I was expecting her to say, you know, we tried, it didn't work out, I'm sorry. And she said, okay, they liked our proposal, but they just said it was impossible. So let's build it first and reapply. <laughs> <laughs> so this perseverance, yeah, that mm. kind of like, I don't take no for an answer ever. That's like so Roz and I've learned yeah. that from her. Yeah. That's awesome. And the commitment to you that it wasn't kind of like, oh, you'd be nice to have, but there was like a real focus on, no, I want to make this happen with her. Yeah. I was really struck by that. And I think particularly now because, you know, this is such a strange time for some people to be thinking about their careers or their next steps or graduating from school. For a tiny sliver, there's massive opportunity. And for most people, there's deep uncertainty. And it really struck me that you lived in a different context through great uncertainty and you happened to find somebody who really believed in you. And it was. Yeah. And I, I can't, yeah, that is so important. You just need one person who is a cheerleader who will help support you, give you brutally honest advice, but also be there for you. I, I think that's so critical. Yeah. I, I was excited that you had found that. Um, in terms of, what happens, you and Roz end up spinning out of the MIT Media Lab. Mm -hmm. um, you go to the head of the lab and you say, hey, we've just got a lot of fascinating work to be done. Can you give us some more, some more staff to help us? And he said, actually, you should just become a company. Right. Talk about that. Yeah, for background, uh, my career plan all along was to get my PhD and become faculty. So I, I love teaching. I still love teaching. And so that was my career plan all along. So I get to MIT and I was really preparing to, you know, I had done really well in terms of my research. And I was preparing my faculty application. So starting a company was never on my radar. You know, it was never on my radar. But we go to Frank Moss, who's the lab director at the time, as you said because we were getting so much interest in, in the technology. So at the Media Lab, twice a year, we invite all of um, the, partner, the lab partners and industry sponsors, usually Fortune 500 companies. And it, it was called like Sponsor Week or Demo or Die. <laughs> so we had to show like a working demo of the technology. Um, and for you know, three years in a row, twice a year, we would show all this autism work and these companies would say, well, I wanna use it to, you know, Toyota wanted to use it to monitor drivers. Uh, Bank of America. Just, I just wanna talk, you were, you were showing your autism work because one of the projects you were working on was helping children who had autism decipher the emotions of others. That was yeah. one of the, okay. Please exactly, continue. that was actually the NSF grant that brought me over to MIT. So that was my main focus and we would demo it, but it so happened that all these companies were in, were in the audience and they found other applications of the technology. Um, you know, like Procter and Gamble wanted to test people's responses to, you know, the smell of their new shower gels. Like the applications were endless. And I just like kept a book, you know, a log in a book, in my notebook of all, all the different applications. Um, and so eventually, because we were doing nothing about it, um, I thought the solution was to just bring on board more PhD students so that we can tackle these problems. And uh, Frank Moss, uh, the lab director at the time, he said, you know, this is not a research challenge anymore. This is a commercialization opportunity. Start a company. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember like my knee jerk reaction was like, you're messing with my faculty plans. Like what? But I thought about it. And I think the tipping point for me was realizing that I had an opportunity to take something that I'm very passionate about and scale it, like, like bring it out to the world in a very big way that can change how companies connect with their consumers, how we connect with one another. Um, yeah. And so, so, so we spun out of MIT 10 years ago. And a very big way, also, as you describe it, um, you could say messier or just market-driven way, right? So like the things that you found yourself focused on and how you explained what you were doing were very sensitive to who your investors and consumers might be. You described, it's amazing to me, we, 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 you know, you're known for emotional AI. You could not use the word emotion when you were talking to venture capitalists at the beginning. Yes. So Explain that because I found that puzzling. <laughs> yeah. 
We called that the E word. So when we first uh, spun out, uh, you know, we were raising money. And so we did a whole kind of pitch, um, you know, up and down Sand Hill Road. Um, and so Roz and I, you know, flew out. out. And exactly. All the investors uh, on the West Coast. And we had lined up all of these investor meetings. It had taken months to, to get them on the books. And we were very excited. But if you look at our early investment pitch decks, we literally never were, used the word emotion because, because our audience were, you know, these, you know, older white guys who, um, uh, and, we, and we were these like two academic women scientists talking about emotions. So kind of, that, a, yeah, was it that like they were interested in investing in things that would reduce the role of emotions in human life? And you were saying, no, no, these things will always matter. So we're going to help decipher them. Was that the conflict or what was it exactly? Yeah, I think the conflict was, and this has changed over the last few years. Um, I think at the time, um, emotions was kind of synony synonymous with irrationality and why would we need that, right? And we had to argue that, no, 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 no. If you look at, you know, affective and cognitive neuroscience, our emotions actually drive our decision making and, and people who have damaged, you know, um, the emotion set centers of their brain, they're actually a lot worse off as, you know, they, in terms of how they conduct their daily lives. And so we had to always make the case for why emotions matter. I think the world has changed. So just over the last 10 years, there's a lot more acknowledgement that our emotion, emotional engagement between, you know, consumers and products and services matter. Uh, our emotions matter in how we run our teams and our companies. Um, so yeah, so a few years ago, we kind of embraced Hill, it. Did those Sand Hill Road investors have emotions? Did they, <laughs> did they have them? They did. So a lot of them were just absolutely fat. Like, I would say awe was the emotion. Uh, we always went in with, like, live demos. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> uh, we always went in with live demos of the technology, and uh, they were always fascinated and intrigued. Uh, yeah, intrigue was, I guess, the emotion. But I also think... Um, we discomfort was another emotion. I think they were just uncomfortable. We were, we were so different than what they were used to backing up um, that it was hard. It was hard to raise money. Right. Now I was fascinated by that part of your book because you know I moved to Silicon Valley from the East Coast, uh -huh. um, and in my twenties, my world was full of um, I would say people who were very emotional and expressive uh -huh. uh, in a world of activism and, and prisoner rights. And then I came over to Silicon Valley where I began reporting on technology. And I, I was struck by the number of people I'd met who seemed to think that they didn't have emotions as opposed to just being blind to what they were. And so I read your book and I'm like, yeah, exactly. It's so weird. <laughs> so I was even like, you know, a sort of celebrated technologist had that same kind of dissonance that, that yeah. I have. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, yeah, absolutely. So, Rana, something that happens in your life experience that, you know, we hear a lot about, um, and you certainly lived through, was where you got your first chunk of money from. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily what you thought you were in it for. Um, Affectiva becomes a company, and as I understand it fairly quickly, becomes a marketing research firm that basically you become an engine for digital advertising that really becomes your core competency mm -hmm. you land a big client uh cancer millward brown um their parent company wpp invested 4.5 million I, it was that that was your first big breakthrough in cash 4.5 million from a global advertising and branding firm what was that like for you? Unpack it, because it must have been complicated. <laughs> it, it was. Um, yeah, so, so, so at the moment we spun out of MIT, the main application of the technology was autism, right? But as we started, but we also recognized that, oh my goodness, this is a core platform technology that has a lot of use cases across industries. So we kind of knew that too, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think the key realization was that if we were going to raise venture funding, 
Yeah, I, I think the key learning was that you had to look at the total addressable market, that the TAM, right? Like how big was that market? Because that was going to, that, that was kind of what got a lot of the investors excited. Um, so yeah, so the first kind of big, well, no, well, it was our, it was our seed funding, um, but the first kind of real check we got was to apply the technology in um, advertising research to understand how people emotionally engage with content. The way I thought about it is I've always thought about this technology as bridging a communication gap. So we all watch content, but we, we can't always communicate back to the content creators and give them feedback. We can give them feedback in a survey, but what about the moment by moment engagement? And so I found it um, kind of in line with our, with, with our journey, I guess, um, if we were able to detect how people respond to content and summarize that. I didn't want it to be the destination though. I've, I've always wanted it to be a stop along the journey, but not the final destination. What do you mean? Well, so for, so once we kind of signed on this big partner and, and, you know, to their credit, they helped us bring the technology to 90 countries around the world. So we became instantly a global company and which helped the accuracy of the technology. So uh, in addition to driving revenue, right? Um, so we're very fortunate to have them as investors and strategic partners of ours. Um, but a few years into that, I, I, ha I had an awakening, right? I was like, wait a second, this is not why we started the company. I didn't want to just do that. I wanted the technology to be applied elsewhere. And so in 2014, I made a case to the board that we look at other market opportunities and make our technology available for other industries, you know, like automotive or mental health. Um, and that's when we actually partnered with a company that does use Google Glass. They're called BrainPower. So they use Google Glass and our technology to help autistic kids. And, and that just, you know, I, I feel that these are the ways with which we fulfill our original vision uh, mm -hmm. for the company. And just flush out a little bit more, what are some of the use cases that that have excited you thus far or down the line? And maybe advertising is among them. I'm not telling you either way what it should be. I'm more just trying to understand. Because as I understand, there's just the fact of who's going to pay for this kind of expensive research. Right. Right. And then there's where, where other technologies are. Like, for example, the availability of things like Google Glass. Yeah. Um, and how, you know, sort of how that happens, how that evolves over time. As a matter of fact, Affectiva is largely basically marketing research. That's your bread and butter. That's where the money is coming. But the thing you'd be, the things you're more excited about, explain one or two of those examples. Yeah. We actually, a few, a few years ago, we made a strategic kind of um, uh, exercise to look at what other big markets are there. And we landed on automotive as being one of them. So, so I would say at the moment, a lot of our mind share at the company is going towards the automotive industry. And the application there is, you know, as you're driving, I, I have a 16 year old daughter who's about to start driving. And I wish that I can make, oh, good well, luck, I should say. <laughs> I, I don't know what's coming out of But I wish the technology was there where, where it could flag if she was distracted while driving, if she was fatigued if she was asleep you know if there were a lot of her friends in the car and 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 um and it was unsafe right so that's one use case where you know you can detect driver impairment um but also as we reimagine the future of of transportation and all of these you know semi-autonomous and fully autonomous robo taxis there's a lot of um ways we could sense what's happening inside the cabin like how many people are in the car what's their sentiment can you personalize um, and the idea being that what your technology does is it basically maps each face according to points that don't move so much, like the tip of my nose, and points that move a lot, like my lips, uh -huh. and thereby basically track the emotions of the person. Is that right? Just yes, yes. It's almost. Not really. Exactly. No, no, it's, it's very close. So, yes, it uses these kind of points on the face to triangulate the face, but then it uses all the pixels on the face to map that to an expression. So using deep learning. So we, we kind of triangulate where the face is and then that becomes the input to the algorithm. And it, but the algorithm is looking for exactly to your point, the movement of these like main feature um, 
facial features like your mouth or your mm -hmm. eyebrows or your eyes. Mm -hmm. And so you were saying, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, this is great. And then it maps it to um, states like, okay, if you're, you know, if you're doing this, then you're falling asleep. Or if you're doing, then you're distracted texting, right? Um, mm -hmm. So we build this kind of intelligence into the car and then the car can take real time actions. And the range of actions the car can take vary by, by the manufacturer. Some, you know, sometimes right. they just show a, a you know, a, a give you an alert um, all mm -hmm. the way to maybe they can, you know, the car seat can zap you and kind of say, pay attention mm -hmm. or wake up or something. Right. And there is, it's in line with there are so many um, automated features that are being built into the acts of driving, flying, whatnot, to correct for our many, many human errors. And so you're beginning to see your own technology being used in the automobile context. Exactly. So that's one case. The other one is that I'm very excited about, even though it's not a main focus of the company, um, mm -hmm. is, is mental health. So, and again, it's so, it's so exasperated given our, you know, this global pandemic. So the idea is as you spend time on, you know, we're spending a lot of time on our device, um, but there are facial and vocal biomarkers for things like stress, anxiety, um, even depression. We know that there are early indicators of depression, Parkinson's. Do you imagine if every time we're on our device, which is a lot, you could capture this with people's consent, you capture this baseline, and then you're able to you know, quantify if people deviate from this baseline um, and flag that to the person. You could flag that to a family member um, mm -hmm. a, a psychiatrist, right? Like there's a lot, there's a lot you can do with that data. Um, that can be very helpful and it brings send out an alert. Yeah, exactly. Right. Can you tell me a little bit, you just mentioned the sort of, you know, people opt into it and you talked about in your book, um, you know, the importance to you of people opting and knowing that for any, even at the beginning of this talk, people knowing what's going on. That's a, a, a great standard to have. And it's, it's becoming, uh, in many sectors and thanks in part to movements in Europe, the standard. Uh, at the same time, you have had many partners, business partners, who don't have that standard. And I wanted to understand a bit, and this is really a question about the tech ecosystem, me trying to understand how it works. For example, I believe in 2013, you were preparing to work with Facebook on an experiment placing advertisements in videos, you had a Facebook partnership. I'm not sure if you still do. That's one company that very notably did not have that kind of standard. Um, and so in building your business, did you ever talk with partners who were passively surveilling, not asking for actual authorization about their practices? Yes. So in our, that was kind of something we decided on, Roz and I decided on very early on in the company's trajectory. Because again, we realized that there were so many applications and we were like, okay, where are we going to draw the line? Um, and mm -hmm. so, um, and, and we decided that consent and opt-in were like core values that we would not, non-negotiable. And we, so that's built into the terms, you know, the license agreement of our technology. So if you license our technology, you are not allowed to use it without consenting people. Um, and we routinely get approached by you know, by companies or governments that want to use it for surveillance. Like in 2011, I talk about that in the book, we almost ran out of money, but we got approached. So we were raising money, but we were very close to the, you know, to running out of cash. And we got approached by an intelligence agency that wanted us to pivot to using the technology for security and lie detection. And, and, and it was, it was, you know, it was hard in the sense of, you know, we didn't know if we could raise money elsewhere. So in a sense, it was like there was this existential threat uh, mm -hmm. um, on, on the viability of the company's future. But at the same time, it was so far from um, why we started the company and our core values that we just, we turned the funding down. Um, yeah, you we, just we said it was $40 million. Dollars. That's a lot yeah, of funding. It was a lot. It was a lot of funding. Right. I, you know, I noticed that. And actually, the question I'm asking is a little bit different. Um, it, you made a, a decision early on in your company's development to not become associated with government surveillance as a core business. You made that decision. Um, but in the businesses of advertising, which is less innocuous, but 
high sure. stakes, uh, you know, a, a lot of involved. When you partner with companies that are not holding the same privacy standards, okay, you've got written in your terms, hey, this is what we expect of you. But do you have a mechanism to enforce that? Like when you partner with Facebook, are you actually making sure they abide by your terms or is it basically, we're just going to assume that you are? No, we have to, we have to enforce it. So in the way you use our technology, you can't, you, we can't record you unless there's a very clear consent. And in fact, it's not just a legalese, like five page consent thing. It's a very clear like paragraph written in plain English that says, mm -hmm. Hey, we're going to turn on the webcam. Here's how we're going to use it. Here's who, who's going to get access to the data. And that is true for all the work we've done so far. And that's mm -hmm. a, regardless of the partner, to your point. Yeah. Uh -huh. And do you feel that that kind of standard has been an outlier in the tech industry? Or do you feel like for video recording, it's a norm? Um, I think... I think what we're seeing in the last couple of years, and I'm sure, I mean, you've been covering this, mm -hmm. um, this, this, this tech clash, right? Like this backlash against technology and this realization by consumers that all this data is being collected and there's really very little transparency on who's collecting it and for what purpose. I think we need, a, I mean, one reason I wrote the book is I wanted to bring consumers into the dialogue, into the conversation around, okay, how are, what do we want this AI to look like? And um, what are these core principles like data privacy, like transparency, power asymmetry? Like if you look at who has access to the data, it's often, you know, a few tech giants and, and governments. Mm -hmm. And, and as, as a user or a consumer who's sharing that data, I get very little value out of it. And I think we need to like rebalance that um, power asymmetry. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done there. This, what I find the tech lounge, yeah. is that a conversation you would have with colleagues of yours in industry? Yes. Like even yeah. without naming names, I'm just kind of curious, what did that sound like? Cause to me, it's sort of in my reporting, what's clear is that everyone knew that these were issues before it became politicized and then the political pressure made people address. Yeah, no, we would even back in 2011, when we first started doing all of this advertising work, we came in with the position, we are going to tell people we're turning the cameras on. In some cases, we record the videos, but in some cases, like in automotive, we don't record any of the data. And that's a conversation we lead with. Um, and I, I also see it as also educational, like a lot of our partners hadn't even thought about it. And so for us to bring it up, Mm -hmm. and, and be proactive about it and, and, and you know, set the standards. I, I see that as an important um, part of our responsibility and our role as a, as a leader, as a pioneer in this, in this space. Mm. Let's switch gears now. And I want to talk about your personal journey, your own life. Um, I think half of your book is really about that. Um, mm -hmm. And let's start with your mom. Um, who I think is another really powerful role model, as you describe her. She sounds like an incredible woman. Uh, I could not get enough of her. Uh, you <laughs> described her in her early years before you were ever born, she being kind of like a nerd girl who wore mini skirts and went yeah. clubbing and got A's <laughs> in school. And your dad, who was her teacher, fell for her. Uh, you know, different time, different norms were okay then. Uh, <laughs> and even when she has you and your siblings, you and your sisters, um, she continues to have a career, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, that's extraordinary, especially for a woman of that generation in the quote unquote old world. Did you ever talk with her about her balancing act and how she was both a career woman and a mom and a wife? Yeah, I think it was, it, and my mom was not like entirely the exception. I mean, you know, there's, there's, um, there isn't one narrative for, for as, as you would know, uh, for, for women, you know, um, in, in countries like Egypt and, and around the world. Um, so, so for my mom, she was a working woman. She worked throughout her entire career. And, um, but it was interesting. It was very clear that her job almost had boundaries, right? Like, so when she left work, or whatever it was, 3 p.m. or 4 p.m., and got back home. That was the end of it. We never heard her talk about um, her work at home. And in fact, she was never allowed to travel on business trips. Um, 
And I only realized later that the only business trips that she was allowed to go on were the ones where we could package it as a family vacation. So we would all go with her and she would disappear for hours every, you know, every day to go do her business meetings. And, and, and it didn't hit me until I was an adult that, oh, interesting, like your career, you know, y- you did work, but, but there was almost like these bound borders that were built around her career. And um, yeah. It's Mm -hmm. nuanced, right? Right. Yeah. Your first date. Um, Similarly to your mom, you met your husband, then husband Wael, in the process of pursuing your professional passions. Uh, He was building a startup. You had a job interview with that startup. Uh, And then after that, he asked you out. Describe your first date. Oh, our, our first day or when we met, where we first met during the interview, he did not interview me, but he was the f- co-founder of that company. Um, and and I, I interviewed with somebody else on his team and it was a startup, right? And my dad was like, why would you want to work with a startup? Because I was, you know, I graduated top of my class and they were in this small. What are these rinky dink startups? What is that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, why are you going there? And he wanted to come with me to the interview. And I was like, no, oh no, oh no, we're not going to do that. So he, he waited for me in the car. And he I drove went, you to the interview. He, he drove me to the interview. Um, and I, I walked in and it was this, you know, they were a new startup. Um, they didn't have a lot of chairs. And I was dressed in like a skirt and, you know, with my laptop. And, and the first thing my interviewer says is like, we don't have any chairs for this interview. So do you want to do it on the floor or you want to reschedule? And I was like, no, it's okay. I'll do it on the floor. So I sat down on the floor with my skirt, very uncomfortable, <laughs> very mm-hmm. awkward. And Whale kind of walked across the room and he was like typical tech founder, right? Like he was in socks and shorts. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I didn't notice him, but he, he, he noticed me and he kind of pursued, I did not get the job. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> just saying, but he, mm-hmm. He pursued me and, and our first date was, um, we went out for ice cream. We did a lot of texting um, and we also kind of, we were very, we were a very geeky couple, I think. Um, were you allowed to go on that first date? It wasn't clear to me. I was not. I see. I, so was, not allowed, I was not allowed to date. So, um, yeah. but you know, it was an ice cream date and we walked around the city. So I reckoned it was okay. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and it could have been a professional meeting of sorts. Sure. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but so I, your but father I, wasn't there. Okay. Exactly. Very, very soon after, I let my two sisters and my mom in, in into this, and so my mom met him, and she really liked him. But we didn't tell my dad until like right before it became obvious that this was going to be serious, and he would propose, which mm. was like a year into into this. So. <laughs> into this right right there's always that interesting thing about how you're not allowed to date until you're supposed to have a husband right that 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 period in between which is (laughs) utterly unclear for for many who straddle that kind of that world so you described this and I, i i literally like i burst out laughing uh you guys go ahead and you you decide you're getting married and you and yl both read stephen covey's the seven habits of highly effective people yes in it he recommends that individuals write personal mission statements like organizations do. And you guys had the idea, let's do a marriage mission statement. So Mm -hmm. you write a mission statement for your marriage. I have it here. Uh, Quote, we want to be the hub for our community, our family, our friends, and our coworkers, and be a force of positive impact. Um, That is an amazing statement. (laughs) (laughs) Do you feel that you lived up to your end of it? Um, I think by and large, we did. I mean, as, as a couple, we were very, um, we were, our house was always open. We always hosted all these, you know, uh, all these events. I think people looked up to us because we were both very successful in our careers. From the outside, we looked like a perfect family, actually, because we had like, you know, good kids. We looked you know, very successful. He was very supportive of my career all along, which is unusual for um, men, men in, in that part of the world. Um, so, so, I, so, and I, so I do think we had a positive impact on people around us. Um, but also I think over time, a lot of my, I took all of, uh, I took a little bit of that or all of it for granted. And I shifted my focus to the company. Like I basically, you know, 
assumed that this would last. And I just kind of said, okay, let me focus on the company now because the company really needs me. And that really hurt, hurt our marriage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say though, by the way, that um, I now do the same exercise with my kids. Um, we, we do that. We do goal setting uh, at the beginning of every year. And interestingly, our mission statement is very similar. It's, it's, it's a very similar mission statement. So I, I think it, I think it was true to who I am. It was definitely true to who it was and my, it resonates with my kids too. So it's good. You know, you described um, a couple of moments in the book of your relationship with your husband. It was largely long distance, mm -hmm. right? You got married and then um, shortly thereafter, you were off um, in the U.S. Um, commuting between Massachusetts and Cairo, um, but long distance, relying a lot on texting um, and the phone. You describe missing many of the cues of his disappointment, um, in part because you literally could not see him and texting doesn't convey that right. actually he's sad, actually he's not okay tonight, actually, and as you described it, you weren't either. And I wondered if I was reading it, because I mean, we've all had that experience. Like I, if there were an app and maybe it's something that you're going to be involved in developing that helped us understand each other's emotions in the process of text, it would probably correct for a lot of pain we cause each other. I can see it. I believe it. At the same time, as I was reading your story, I couldn't help but wonder, okay, if she read YL's emotions more correctly, if she actually got what was going on with him, yeah. would she have done anything differently? You know, it is, it is a, it's a great question. Um, I don't know if, if the stakes were, okay, he's unhappy, which means that I have to resign from my job at MIT or, you know, I wouldn't start the company if it was like that black and white. I don't know if I would have made different decisions, but I also feel like by the time I figured out that our marriage was falling apart, it was too late. He had already, he had already kind of checked out and he, right. Like, like heard enough to be checked out. Um, so I wonder if like getting that information would have acted as a lead indicator and allowed us to at least have a conversation. Like by the time we were talking about this, it was so broken. Yeah. And in retrospect, I mean, in, in retrospect, it's kind of unfortunate that I spent my entire career teaching machines how to read emotions and at the same time missed the key emotions, you know, of my life partner. That's, you know, sad and ironic. Mm -hmm. um, and I, yeah. yeah. It's, you know, for me as a reader, um, and I'm not living your life, I'm just a spectator in it through your book. Um, I actually wondered if it was, as much as we might develop tools to understand each other, there are also just rifts that you can't overcome. I mean, you have lived a life where the number of worlds you've crossed are so many. I mean, coming from... Egypt from, you know, you wore a hijab for many years. You were much more conservative in, in very pronounced ways. Not that that's in the top of being conservative. I, what I mean is that, you know, you didn't date right. for basically, you know, until you were an adult. Um, you really followed certain rules, but the career that you wanted, because you are ambitious. I mean, that screams out on the page. The career you wanted it's so large. I had a hard time seeing where the compromise would have been. Yeah. As a yeah. It, it is, it is a really good question. And I, I often wonder about that. I, I can tell you that I, I often picture like if I hadn't taken that path, what would my life look like? And it would have probably looked very different. I would probably be back in Cairo living in kind of some, you know, you know, awesome Cairo suburb, probably with three kids uh, and, you know, keeping very busy with my kids' education and schooling, you know, with, with a full-time, you know, support system, it would just look very different, not better yeah, or worse. teaching, yeah, but not yeah. defining a field. Right? Exactly, just different, right, right. yeah. 
Ron, can I ask you to go ahead and read um, a passage from your book, Girl Decoded? This is you describing your efforts to keep your marriage together. Um, the men in your family have given you amazing advice while you're doing your long distance relationship. They tell you, come back home, get out of America, come to Egypt. And the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. You must learn to cook <laughs> and start being a proper wife. Just if you guys want to go ahead and read this passage, what you attempted to do. So here's the book, everybody. And the ch chapter is called Grounded in Cairo. Um, as I Arti was saying, um, um, my in-laws and my parents basically mandated that I'm not allowed to travel for a year uh, to fix my marriage. So, okay, let's see. I made a tremendous effort to rebuild our family life. I honed my cooking skills, which weren't much to begin with. One evening, I summoned the family together to make sushi, which Wael Riley referred to as team building. And when Wael was away on a four day trip to Dubai for business, I decided to redecorate the bedroom in an effort to dispel the, dispel the bad memories so that we could start fresh. With the help of my mother and my aunt, I selected new wallpaper and a lovely bedding ensemble and decluttered the room. When Wael came home, I showed it to him with a big smile. He nodded in approval. Up until that point, I had been sleeping in Adam's room, my son. I asked, so may I sleep in here? Absolutely not, Well responded. I hid my, disappointed, my, I hid my disappointment and swallowed my tears. To be fair, Well didn't lead me on. He told me that he was sticking around because his parents had asked him to stay and for the kids. In other words, he was telling me to stop trying to fix something that couldn't be fixed. After being grounded in Cairo for several months, I asked for a brief timeout to fly to Boston to meet with several key clients. I undertook the trip only because it was important for the future of Affectiva. As I was sitting at my desk in Boston, pouring over data, my father called, Rana, Forget about Affectiva, just sell it or resign. Get rid of it. Tell them you can't work there anymore. Dad, I said, what are you talking about? It's my company. I knew he was coming from a place of love. His priority was fixing the marriage because he believed that would ultimately make me happy. But I was still disappointed. It was also clear to me that the same rules didn't apply to men. No one was asking Wael to leave his company to move to Boston. Why not? I was also deeply hurt that my dad was asking me to walk, to walk away from what I'd worked my entire professional life to achieve. And just when our fledgling company seemed to be hitting its stride. It was hard to accept. At the time, I believed that my parents didn't understand what I did, and I felt that they didn't feel proud of me. If they could choose, I felt they'd pick Rana, the happily married mother and housewife, over Rana, the successful AI entrepreneur. What I wanted wasn't important to them. I never shared with anyone what my father said to me on that phone call, nor did I talk to my dad about it again. That's still true, by the way. But his point had been made, and I've never forget forgotten about it. Even as I was hiding out in Cairo, my work was getting noticed. In September 2012, I was selected by the MIT Technology Review as one of its 35 innovators under 35 in technology. It's a very prestigious list to be on. Among the people who have made it are Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg and the co-founders of Google, Sergey Brin and Larry Page. I couldn't go to Boston to accept the award because I was grounded. So my mom threw a small surprise celebration at her place, inviting my sisters, my aunt, and my in-laws. She prepared a small feast and bought a cake. When I got to my parents' apartment and realized what she had in mind, I was alarmed. 
such a party would only exasperate the tensions between Wael and me. Mom, please don't do this, I said. Don't mention my award. Let's just make this a family dinner, okay? My mother got it. I didn't want to draw any more attention to the fact that I was becoming more and more successful. It would further reinforce Wales' belief that I had prioritized work and my career over him. I could feel the fracture lines it would create in my marriage, and I was determined to underplay my success and achievements rather than hurt Wael. Nevertheless, I was bitterly disappointed not to be able to accept my award in person. That was tough. <laughs> <laughs> my heart is like beating so fast. Yeah. Um, why? Why? Yeah. Why? Yeah, I, I can, I can still remember that time. I can still remember the, com you know, the phone call from my dad. Um, I remember the sushi incident, you know, where I was like really excited to, re you know, fix our marriage and, but he could see through it. You know, he, he, he just, yeah, team building. Um, and I, and I really remember that, you know, you know, that award, the 35 under the 35 under 35 and, and not being able to, it's a, it's a, it's an amazing event, right? Like the, you know, the award winners get to give a five minute pitch on their invention and it's a big deal. And, and I, I wasn't there. And mm -hmm. um, I remember clearly kind of arguing with my mom. I'm like, mom, like, no, we're not going to celebrate. Don't even bring it up. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want the spotlight to be on my successes or on my career. It, it was almost like I, I wanted to be, the furthest away from that. Um, um, yeah. So I, yeah, I remember, yeah. all, I can remember all uh, of that. Mm -hmm. a, a line that you had had in there, um, just, you know, about how your success hurting your husband at the time is part of your takeaway or part of your, what you learned about sort of your, in your journey of becoming successful, that the bigger you get from how the, the less, lovable or accepted you'll be by your partner? I wonder, is, is that what she's thinking or feeling in this? I, 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 I felt at the time that the two were in conflict um, because I felt like the main issue, and, and, and I heard that from friends and family, right? That like the, basically the message was, if you can only come back and just be a wife and a mother, like just, just focus on that and, you know, and, and focus less on your work, everything would be fine. And so a lot of the blame was put on me for, for better or worse. Um, and, 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 and for a very long time, I, I, I believe that I, you know, I, I believe that, you know, I, I broke this thing. Um, I don't know if that's true because it takes two to tango, but um, yeah, I, I just wonder if I had done things differently, if it would turn, you know, if things would have turned out different. I, I don't know. Um, I, I have become though, what's interesting is after the divorce and coming, you know, moving to Boston full time with my kids and just like really um, owning, you know, owning that I am a pioneer in this field and, and, and just really embracing it, you know, my career took off, right? It was so interesting how I was held back by all these like cultural and societal norms. Um, yeah, I felt, I felt like it, I shouldn't be that successful. I really shouldn't. And so I was trying to downplay it. You know, Rana, it struck me, ultimately where you find home is in America. It's in the United States. Congratulations on buying in 2016, by the way. Um, I happened to buy that year too, another thing we haven't seen. Oh, cool. Uh, so, <laughs> um, you've lived in different countries. Um, Throughout the Middle East and Northern Africa. Yeah. Uh, no, actually, no, I've, I've only been in the U.S., uh, but born in Northern Africa. Um, you were also in England uh, as well as in the U.S. You've lived in different countries, and I wonder for you, having had the different experiences you've had and then coming to the U.S., what to you is the essence of the American identity? Hmm. 
I would say, and I'm, I'm just so grateful and proud to, to be American. I'm also like so grateful and proud to be Egyptian too. So, um, you know, a lot of my journey is reconciling the two. I think what is so special about this country, the U.S., is, is, is this ability to forge your own path regardless of your background. And of course, the more time I spend here, I, the more I realize that it's not equal opportunity exactly, right? It's, it's not exactly that, but still, it's way more likely for you to break boundaries and be creative and take risks in this country than it is, you know, back in Egypt. And, I, and for me, that is the essence of this country. And, and it's why we love being here. There's so much opportunity and just so much, yeah, so much opportunity to forge your own path and what could be more wonderful. Mm -hmm. You felt in some, you t described it as being not pigeonholed. Finally, you were in a place where you were not pigeonholed. Exactly. Like even mm -hmm. now when I go back to Egypt, I lo we love going back to Egypt and my family are still there. But I feel such a misfit, right? I don't fit into any of the categories of being a woman or, you know, even being a businesswoman. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and here in the U.S., I feel like you can be anything you like, you want to, anything you want to be. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also think, you know, and that's, that's a big theme in the book, too. Um, I celebrate diversity, and I think it's so important to the work I do. It's so important to Affectiva and the culture I've built. And it's just, I, I, I feel very fortunate that we get to be in a country that welcome, you know, supposedly welcomes people from all over the world with all sorts of backgrounds and experiences and beliefs. I think that that's so magical. And, you know, we live in a Boston suburb where a lot of people have never met Muslim, you know, Muslim Egyptians. And, and I feel like we're bridging a gap you, we're making the world smaller by sharing our experience and bringing people into our world. Um, mm -hmm. And I, 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 I love this, you know, again, that's something I love about this country and we should make sure it doesn't go away. Yeah, no, it's something that really struck me in your journey is that, you know, this place, just the sheer distance between your original home and here gave you the space to spread your wings. And I actually think that that's a, a recurring part of a lot of women's migrant women's journeys to this country is whether you are, you know, a celebrated MIT technologist, whether you are a day laborer, mm -hmm. um, being able to leave where you came from so you can realize what's inside of you seems to be a, a really consistent part of the immigrant woman's journey to this country. Mm -hmm. And I feel like like your book really captured that. Um, I'm going to ask you just one more question of my own, and then I have to to give it up. Um, you uh, describe in your book actually two big breakups, okay? There's one with your husband, um, but there's also the splitting in your company uh, of the hardware work and the software work. Affectiva becomes a software company, and your co-founder, partner in crime, Ross Picard, leaps. Um, you describe it as a, as a tense departure and I wanted to know, you know, because I, I was so into your relationship with each other. <laughs> I wanted to know, what is it like now? What had become of your relationship with Roz? Are you talking now? What's some of it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so what happened is in 2013, we had two core technologies, basically, when we started the company. One is the facial analysis technology, which was my baby. But we also had a hardware device, like a wrist wearable device that measured physiological signals and that was really Roz's baby and for the for the first few years of the company they had both very different applications the wrist sensor was very focused on medical use cases like seizure detection and um, you, you know very very medical oriented and you know as you know as we talked about the facial stuff was very market research focused um, and so as a, as a board we decided and hardware is so hard so we decided to unwind the hardware business was a strictly business decision, but it created a, a big rift between Roz and the company, but especially between Roz and I, because um, we were, you know, we'd started this together and we were so committed to it. Um, and for a couple of, I mean, we're, 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 we're talk, we're on talking terms now, and she's a big supporter of what we do. When I stepped into the CEO role in 2016, she celebrated that, um, 
but, but we're not, we're not as close as we used to. And, and, you know, that, that's very painful for me um, because I, I still respect her just the same. I'm still grateful just the same. She's still my mentor just the same, but we don't have that close. Something broke and, you know, I don't, I don't know if we'll get there. In our 10th year anniversary for the company, which we did, at, we celebrated at MIT, I, you know, I invited her on stage and, you know, we hugged each other and we were both in tears. So I think we're rebuilding the relationship um, and hopefully it'll get back to where it was someday. Hmm. I hope so as well. Yeah, I was very, I, I was wondering about that. And actually, I, I was told I do have time for one more question to ask one. This is now more on the, the technology and policy front. Yeah. Um, in, in recent months, the discipline that your technology relies on has, um, you could say, come under fire or criticism or critical light in two different ways. Um, there is growing concern about facial recognition technology, how it's used. Um, you know, developing an, an opt-in settings that can still easily be taken to one that are passing surveillance. Yeah. Uh, the city of Oakland, actually, where I'm based, yeah. uh, recently banned facial recognition tech because of concerns for it. Um, but it's not hard to imagine the horror stories of how it could be used. You know, for example, selling me the wrong thing because you misread my face is one thing. Pulling me out of an airport security line because you misread my face is another. Right. Um, and another way that it's come under fire is recently, it was a few months ago, the Association for Psychological Science commissioned a study to review uh, a thousand pieces of, of scholarship on emotional AI. And it was interesting because your technology is based on this idea that there are uh, expressions that are universal and if you can categorize them properly, you can decipher um, how someone is feeling. And according to the authors of this research, looking at different studies, they basically reject that premise. They say, actually, that's not true. Um, what an expression means is diverse and it's content and culture dependent. Um, an author of that study, she said, companies can say whatever they want, but the data are clear. Uh, that was Lisa Feldman Barrett saying that to The Verge. Um, what do you say to that? Because I, I was struck that basically the underlying science is being really challenged. Yeah, I actually happen to agree with Lisa's work and we, 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 we know each other. Um, mm -hmm. And if you look back at my dissertation now over like 15 years ago, mm -hmm. I basically, so, 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 so what Lisa's saying is a lot of the, the industry is taking a very simplistic approach to this whole understanding emotions. So for example, it simplifies it to like, if you smile, you're happy. If you do this, you're angry. If you do that, you're surprised. And we all know that that's not true. It's way more complex than that. So for example, I might raise my eyebrows because I'm surprised, but I might raise my eyebrows to acknowledge something you said to show comprehension or to, you know, if we're passing each other on a street, especially if you're wearing a mask, then I might raise my eyebrow to say hi, right? Mm -hmm. So there is no one-to-one -one mapping between a facial expression and an emotional state. And by reducing the complexity of all of that into like these six basic emotions, like happy, sad, surprise, angry, disgust, uh, fear. Um, we are, we're hurting, we're hurting this whole field. And so, you know, in my research and what we do at Affectiva, we basically acknowledge that it's a complex problem. Um, you have to, um, did I lose you? Did I, I'm here. Okay. I thought I lost you for a second. Um, but yeah, second, basically, um, so basically the idea is to acknowledge that these are complex signals and you have to look at the temporal uh, dynamics of the signal. You have to incorporate other cues like gestures or vocal intonations and you have to know the context. Am I watching a video online or am I, um, you know, or am I driving a car or am I learning? you know, online. So the context becomes really important. So I actually agree with Lisa and her work. Um, but, 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 and, and I feel like we need to educate the public um, on, on, on the nuance of like, we don't want the simplified version. It's a very complex problem. It's not just about detecting a smile and assuming you're happy. Okay, thank you, Rana. On that, thanks for speaking with me for the last hour. And now there are people who have questions for you, and Marguerite is going to field them. Thank you so much, Arthi. It was great.
Bye. Thank you to both of you, Arthi. And now, Rana, I have some questions from the audience. Uh, here's one just following up on your topic about educating the public. This is about digital citizens. Uh, you mentioned uh, in your book and in some interviews that consumers can use their buying power to influence how companies deploy AI, like yeah. maybe organic um, food or fair trade you know, food. What do you think is going to take for consumers to realize and exercise this power in a widespread way? As digital citizens to really make AI ethical. Yeah, I, I'm very excited about this. And I think the way to go about it is to demystify what AI is, right? There's a lot of misconceptions and misunderstanding. The public really doesn't understand what, what is AI and what does it look like and how do you build it and where does it work? And so I try to really make it accessible to the audience. So in my book, my, my book is you know written for, for a very wide audience a lot of which, many of which may not be technologists, but I wanted it to be true to the science, but also accessible to the general public. Because once you understand how it works, you can be a very kind of active, uh, you can play an active part in the conversation on how to drive the ethical development and deployment of AI. And I feel consumers have the power to say, you know what, this company abides by these general ethical AI guidelines. I'm going to you know, buy that product, but I'm not going to engage in that other company's technology because they don't. Um, yeah. Here's a, a several people uh, asked a question that's a variant on this. Uh, this one is phrased from Natalie. She says, I'm a teacher who in, who's invested in human rights and anti-racism. Uh, what, what are the ethics regarding AI, um, AI with regards to systems of power to reinforce oppression, such as policing and, uh, sexism. And then somebody else asked, and what specifically can company leaders do to make better choices? To make better choices around, um, around AI in general? Yes. Yeah. For more ethical use. Yeah. One, one thing that, that, that we think a lot about is this topic of algorithmic and data bias. So as we build these technologies, we don't want to perpetuate the bias that exists in society into these technologies that, that then get deployed at wide scale. Um, and so we spend a lot of time thinking about, okay, is the data balanced? Is the algorithm biased towards any particular minority group? There's been a lot of backlash against facial recognition technology that doesn't work on women of color because it hasn't been trained on a lot of women of color. And so we have to be very thoughtful about that. And I think the best way to avoid or mitigate these biases is to ensure that the team that's developing it is diverse because we all have our own blind spots but if you have a diverse team around the table we can each flag you know our own concerns and then it we end up with a more robust solution great thank you here's a question on something technical this uh, audience member said are you able to detect emotions and people in real time with stream data rather than recorded data also how do you partition the range of emotions that is are there any punctuation points Ooh, i love i love the second half of the question so yes we can detect this in real time uh we have a real-time sdk and, and again imagine if we had this integrated into zoom you could have a real-time kind of engagement chart or engagement graph um, and then in terms of punctuation, you know, that is something that I really, really want to look into. I, I, I believe like the way I think about it is that the facial expressions are just building blocks and, and you can kind of construct a sentence with these building blocks because it's a very temporal signal, um, but we haven't really looked into it much. It's, a, it's something I'm very interested in. What's so number two? Great. Here's a question about your future vision. You've talked about a bit about what you can do now in different applications and also about some of the challenges and how you'll address them. If you were to imagine out what would happen in five or 10 years, what kinds of applications can you imagine? Um, I mean, fundamentally, I, I believe that the de facto human machine interface will be will mirror very much how humans interact with one another through conversation. We're already trying, you know, starting to see that with Amazon Alexa and Siri, um, but it will also have perception. Our devices will have perception and they will have empathy. And that will just unlock a lot of 
you know, I talk in, in the book about um, this idea that maybe your fridge has an emotion chip. And as you approach it, it can detect, you know, that you're bored as we all are and you know, not, not, not bored, but that, you know, you're at home and you know, the easiest thing is to just walk to your, to your fridge and, or, or that you're stressed um, and it detects that and it locks down and doesn't allow you to, um, to get, you know, that extra tub of Ben and Jerry's ice cream, right? So an emotion chip that can detect your mood and that's integrated into the internet of things and the devices that, uh, you know, that are around us. I think this, um, we'll see a lot more of that. Speaking of our time that we're in right now in this COVID where we're, we're all home, here's a question uh, that says, in a post COVID-19 world, do you see people traveling or will people get used to the Zoom world? And if Zoom becomes a norm, how can we enrich communications and relationships? in a protocol driven emotionless world where we hide behind switched off cameras, muted microphones and bad haircuts. <laughs> I could talk about the bad haircuts. Oh goodness. <laughs> um, I, well, I think we will go, I hope we will go back to a world where we can all be together again. Um, whatever that for, you know, whatever form that takes. Um, Cause I crave that personally. Um, but I also think this has, you know, this has catapulted us into this universe where we realize that, yeah, technology can be really powerful in connecting us. Um, I just think right now the tech, the platforms we have are very crude and there's absolutely a way to integrate emotion AI in a way that creates more of a sense of shared experience, right? Like if we were able, again, if I were able to tap into how you all are feeling and what you're all thinking, and, um, you know, that was visualized somehow in real time. I think that could be very powerful in an anonymous way. It doesn't mean we all have to turn our videos on. It just means that the camera is accessible to some software that can just detect your facial expressions, anonymizes it, aggregates it and visualizes it. So you can still be in your pajama pants um, and your bad haircut as, as you tune in, but we could still know how you're engaged or feeling. There's a lot of applications of that, by the way, to online learning. Um, my, my kids are both learning, you know, virtually, like, um, you know, like a lot of kids everywhere. And it's just not the same. Like a te an amazing teacher would be able to tap into the level of engagement of his or her students and personalize the learning experience right away. And it's so hard to do that in a, in a virtual environment, even on Zoom. Like, it's just really hard. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of potential there. Rana, thank you so much for the time that you spent with us. You've talked about your kids and this last question that we have for you on behalf of the museum is about is part of our one word initiative. Where we ask you to think about the next generation. And if you were to write down one word of advice that you would give to a young person, uh, what would that be? And so what's your word? And could you please tell a story about why you chose that? Yeah. Okay, my one word. I don't know if you can see it. Yes. So faith. Um, and the reason I picked this word is uh, as, a, as, a, as an innovator, as an inventor, as an entrepreneur, and also just as a, you know, as a, as a person forging your own path, it often involves imagining a world that doesn't exist yet. Right. You have to picture this universe where, in my case, you know, technology is emotion enabled and you have to think about what that unlocks. And that world does not exist today. And so you have to have faith. And I feel that, you know, throughout my journey, journey, regardless of my level of religion or what that form has taken, I've always have had faith and that things will work out that um, you know, I can continue to forge my own path and I just encourage people out there to have faith. Thank you very, very much. It's been a, a wonderful to have you, Rana, and also Arthi today. This is Rana uh, El Kalubi. You can see her book, Girl Decoded. We're grateful to have you as author, innovator, entrepreneur here on CHM today. Thanks again to both of you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Arthi, for the interview.